Well, good afternoon. And on behalf of the Harlem Cultural Collaborative, it's a consortium of Harlem organizations celebrating the Harlem Renaissance's centennial. I welcome you to this Harlem Literary Salon. Watch for upcoming postings for more virtual salons. These programs are produced by you and Chen of Harlem One Stop. I am Lana Turner, chair of the Literary Society, a 38-year-old book discussion group in New York City based in Harlem. I am honored to have you join us. Following the discussion, you are invited to participate in a Q&A. Enjoy the salon, Zora and Langston, a story of friendship and betrayal with author Yuval Taylor, along with guests Herb Boyd, journalist, educator, author, and activist, and Dr. Vanessa Valdez author and director of Black Studies at the City College of New York. Enjoy. Hey, you all don't seen so much, but I bet you ain't never seen a snake as big as the one I saw when I was a boy up in middle Georgia. He was so big, couldn't hardly move himself. He laid in one spot so long he growed moss on him, and everybody thought he was a log. Till one day I sat down on him and went to sleep. And when I woke up, that snake done crawled to Florida. <laughs> Laying all jokes aside though now, you all remember that rattlesnake I killed last year was almost as big as that Georgia snake? How big you say it was, Frank? Well, maybe not quite as big as that, but just about 14 feet. Give me that lion snake. That snake wasn't but four feet long when you killed him last year, and you done grow them 10 feet in a year. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. My name is Dr. Vanessa Valdez. I am the director of the Black Studies Program at the City College of New York. I ask my guests at the moment to please start video. Um, those of you who are participating, thank you so much for doing so this Sunday afternoon. Um, I would encourage you during the conversation, we'll have the conversation for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A. And so if you could please use the chat function um, at your screen, at the bottom of your screen to ask us any questions or comments, and then we will try to incorporate as many of your questions as possible. You will see, well, I don't know if you'll see it to my left, but um, Dr. Uh, Yuval Taylor is the author of Zora and Langston, A Story of Friendship and Betrayal. Um, and he is the, it is this book that we will be focusing our conversation on. And to my other side is Herb Boyd, um, activist, journalist, educator, also part of the Black Studies Program at the City College of New York. Thank you both for joining me. Herb, could you unmute please? Nope, still. We can't hear you, Herb, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh-oh. One more time. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, I wanted to begin by, by asking you all to contextualize who these people are through the frame of movement, right? We just saw this these biography.com clips um, that kind of, intimated this like this vastly different experience right from the clips you get the impression that Langston Hughes is a particularly urban soul and Zora is like you know more rural but that dichotomy isn't really one that's true to them right so could you please both talk about who these people were prior to their meeting of each other sure um Langston grew up in Lawrence Kansas uh though he had um he had traveled a great deal before he met Zora in 1925. He had uh, traveled the world. He had been on. Um, he'd been to Africa. He'd been to spent time in Paris and Italy, um, and uh, had um, he had been on uh, on on, on uh, freight 
uh, ships all over the world. Um, and he was only 25 when he met Zora, um, but he, he'd seen a lot of the world by then. And he was living in Washington, D.C. at the time and, and um, came up to New York City, which is where they met. Um, Zora had just moved to New York City from Washington, D.C. Um, she had spent most of her life in Eatonville, Florida, um, an all-Black community right outside Orlando, um, and uh, had also traveled some. She, as, as the video said, said she'd lived in Baltimore. Um, and then she uh, went to college in, um, at Howard in Washington, D.C. Um, so they had uh, both done some traveling. Um, at, and at this point, the point that they met, Zora had been living in New York for a few months. And both of them were completely penniless. Um, and they met at a, at, a, at a dinner given by Opportunity Magazine to celebrate uh, Black writing. Yeah. Herb, could you talk a little bit about what, what was the Harlem that these two people found? Oh, my goodness. So one of the things about this is that Harlem is like a magnet. You know, we talked about that before in terms of the epicenter, you know, of American, African-American culture. Um, everyone had to come here, particularly from an entertainment, literary, artistic standpoint. There was nowhere else to go. You were coming from Detroit to Philadelphia, down south, way out west. You had to get to Harlem. And when you got to Harlem, you came to a community that was just as, as vibrant as it could be, particularly in 1920, because that's the period we're talking about. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of controversy, a lot of argument about when did the Renaissance start? What was it all about? Well, Dr. John Henry Clark was one of my mentors, and he always believed that, well, you take Shuffle Along, the Broadway production, and what you had, uh, Noble Sissel and U.B. Blake, these individuals who were prime movers here in terms of writing the music and laying out the, uh, the scenario, they feel that that jump started the Renaissance. That's 1921 now. Some say, uh 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 uh, it was much earlier than that. Let's go back to the end of World War I. Let's go back to Drains Reach Europe. You know, let's go back to the Hall of Hellfighters. These individuals who return from uh, making the world safe for democracy, you know, the whole Woodrow Wilson thing, of course, he's in the news these days, isn't he? <laughs> but anyway, the Renaissance was alive with all of these cultural activities. So when they talk about the Renaissance, ordinarily, for the most part, they're talking about the music and the literature. Uh, I think the music is really second place. It's the literature that's primary. And you had, we've already heard from Langston, we've heard from Zora, but there's a coterie, a whole slew of poets and playwrights and novelists that's a part of this community. That's what Zora, that's what Langston encountered. Langston talked about it in Big C, his mm -hmm. first autobiography, that when he hit Harlem, you know, he came up, he ran into a community, hit the streets right away. And there mm -hmm. he found that vibrancy. He found the activism. He found the clubs. He heard the music. <laughs> right. Um, we are talking about probably the two most famous right figures of the length of the the Harlem Renaissance. But you know, Herb, you just touched on this, and the the clips again gave a little bit of a hint of this. But could y'all flesh out a little bit, like what? Who were these people? What were, what were they trying to do, right? Not just these two figures, but all of them, this generation, and also some that were older. I mean, again, we know that Zora was about a decade older than Langston, but in terms of like established folks, right? Like Du Bois and you know all these other people, right. what were they trying to do? What was the project of the Harlem Renaissance? Well, the project really was to, to, to uh, fight the, the fight the, the, the discrimination, the segregation, the, the oppression through uh, art, through literature, art, music, that kind of thing. And that project was the brainchild of, of Charles Johnson, uh, but W.B. Du Bois was very important with that. So it was Jesse Fawcett. Um, these were the older people who uh, uh, enacted this, 
you know, who, who got uh, a wealth of funding from, from white institutions and white uh, forward thinkers to help the, the artistic movement along. Um, Zora and Langston were part of a younger group of people. Uh, some of them were in their teens, some of them in their early 20s. Zora was one of the oldest, but she pretended to be in her early 20s. Um, that included Wallace Thurman and uh, Bruce Nugent, um, uh, as well as a few, a few people who aren't, who aren't as well known, um, who were trying to um, react against what they thought of as the bourgeois, um, middle-class African-American conception of, of art and culture. Um, and they really pissed off people like W.E.B. Du Bois uh, because they were saying that the Negro art should reflect uh, not the, the high-toned, uh, most the, the upper crust of Negro society, but instead should reflect the, the gutter. Um, and, and Langston was very, was very involved in kind of glorifying um, the, the, the lower class and working class African-American culture. Uh, Zorro is very interested in the folk culture. Um, whereas uh, some of the earlier avatars of the Harlem Renaissance wanted to focus on the, um, the, up, the kind of more upper class culture of, of African-Americans back then. Right. Herb, I mean, something I mean, to add? No? Okay. Well, I was. It's kind of. It's. It's an interesting. Uh, it's an ironic. It's an ir ironic thing because Du Bois, of course, had written *The Souls of Black Folk*, which is one right. of the fundamental um, texts of the period, and yet the folk really weren't. I mean, there the, are the certain kind of folk, and envisioning his vision of folk was not necessarily what Zora Neale Hurston or Langston Hughes were trying to incorporate. Right. And there right, were. Right. Her, right. what when we talk about these these uh, this project, how do you see it? You yourself as someone who has has, in a way, you've inherited this legacy, right? Like you have a heart, you edited an anthology, and so you're you're continuing the steps of Elaine Locke and his new Negro anthology, as well as James Weldon Johnson with his anthology, Nancy Kennard with her anthology. I mean, there's so many that that was a big thing at the moment, right? It was about like creating anthologies. So could you speak a little bit more about the importance of that and, how, and why you did that with your work? Well, I think one of the things, we have to go back to the, uh, the terminology here. Okay. We're saying Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Again, Dr. Clark said he first heard that word from Langston Hughes. And Langston told him and said, Renaissance, oh, I like the sound of that. We should keep it. But the thing about it, Renaissance, you know, is a rebirth. What is it a rebirth of? So again, as you've all pointed out, it's like reflecting back to a previous generation of writers. That's the kind of a, a, presuppos a presupposition that there was this here uh, naissance. You didn't have, you know, it was already going on. And, and to a certain extent it was true because Du Bois would be a part of that. You know, you talk about Charles Chestnut, you can talk about uh, Pauline Hopkins, and you can talk about you know the writers that came out of the 1880s and 1890s, the Frank, uh, Frank Webb, and, and and these writers here were part of that particular period that some of these younger writers coming along was reflecting on and trying to carry on that literary condition. One of the things about this, so much is focus is given on the literary that you lose sight of some of the other elements of the Renaissance. What about the, the painters, right? The painters, I mean, you talk about an Aaron Douglas coming out of that period, and then he's going to be followed up by a Jacob Lawrence. And you talk about the theater. What about the theater? What about the dance? You know, and of course, the music. These are very prominent aspects of this here Renaissance period, representing this artistic flourish that was going on. So, so it's a rebirth. It's like, a, let, let's capture some of those, that energy of the past and kind of renew it, you know, give it kind of a, re, uh, a hope and veneer. Certainly, as you've all points out, you know, with, the, with, the, with somebody like a Zora Neale and Langston Hughes, you have what you call the Twin Towers. Mm 
-hmm. these individuals and ultimately, and I think the convergence of their lives and their art, how they collaborated or did not collaborate becomes like the kind of the wellspring of what Duval is talking about in that book, the whole bone of contention. Mm -hmm. And I think you cannot miss any discussion about them. Certainly the godmother, she's got to play in this year, or Louise Thompson, Patterson, they have to play into this year, particular uh, framework. But I think you have to go back and see what happened with Mule Bone. I think that's what you ball is so important. Yeah, we, we gonna get there, I promise. Before we get there though, um, I wanted to touch on or pick up one of the things that you all, um, both of you actually just mentioned now with regards to white institutions, right? You just mentioned Charlotte Osgood, Mason Herb. Um, we talk about the funding of both of these people, right? Like Charlotte Osgood Mason served as their patron. Um, but, you know, things aren't that different today in terms of the publishing landscape, right, yeah. as it was, um, you know, almost a century ago or a century ago now. So could you all talk about that? Like, what were the roles of a Charles Osgood Mason, a, you know, a Carl Van Becton? What did they do for these two individuals? Well, Carl Van Becton was, was a great friend to both of them, um, and uh, he got he got Langston his publishing deal um, with Knopf. Uh, he introduced Langston to Alfred Knopf. Um, and he got Langston published in Vanity Fair. Um, and um, uh, Fanny Hurst, a great, uh, uh, a, a white American novelist who was extremely popular at the time, uh, took up Zora's cause and, and helped her a great deal. Um, so did uh, Annie Nathan Meyer, uh, an, another white woman who was, um, she had founded Barnard College and she got Zora a place there. And Zora was the only black student there where he's, she studied anthropology. Um, and, uh, and then of course, Charlotte Osgood Mason came in a little bit later in 1928. Um, um, she began to bankroll um, Zora Langston, um, Aaron Douglas, um, and a number of other uh, important people in the Harlem Renaissance and um, bankrolled their work. Now they they all had they all had different kind of styles and different motives, um, but uh, and and they were they they came from different classes and different generations. I mean, Charlotte Osgood Mason and Carl Van Vechten couldn't have been more different, you know. Uh, Van Vechten was flamboyant, uh, homosexual, um, it, uh, just loved to party, went to Harlem all the time, um, threw amazing parties, was friends with Bessie Smith. Um, Charlotte, Charlotte Osgood Mason, on the other hand, um, had this kind of cult-like uh, personality where, where people just worshipped her. She was much older. She was in her 70s, very, very high class, very wealthy, um, had wanted to have nothing to do with the theater, had very little to do with music, um, was focused on much more on literature, and um, had uh, and, and employed Alan Locke as kind of her uh, professor figure to um, to control all the all of her acolytes that 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 she gathered around her, um, and that she supported so munificently. So there there there's a real it, it's a very human it's a very human story of all these interactions. It's not like there was one set white institution that that was in charge of helping the African Americans. There's all these individuals, each with their own motives, each with their own ideas. Um, and each with their own problems. Right. I like. I mean. I think it's 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 interesting at the moment because we have a sense of perhaps like particularly those two people. Um, mm -hmm. But I'd like to remind the audience. You know, the Guggenheim Foundation is a reason that Zora Neale Hurston's research gets funded. Right. Um, lots of folks get funded through the Guggenheim Foundation, um, the Harmon Foundation, right? Mm -hmm. Which had right. The, their art festival and their literary festival. Um, the NAACP was founded by both black and white peoples. And of course, right. it heads up the crisis. 
um, you know, the National Urban League, had white and black founders, what we know today is historically black colleges and universities, many of those founders and presidents at the time were white progressives who believed in the investment and education, investment in and education of black students, right? Because we're talking post-Civil War, how do we incorporate a black population, an African-American population in the civic body, right? If not through education. And so there was a concerted effort to invest right, meaningfully, not only in the arts, right, we see the flourishing of the arts in this moment, but also in structures, right, that would, yeah. were meant to combat the systemic racism that was evident in a society that was built on slavery. Right. right. Yeah. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm agreeing with you. It's great, very good <laughs> points. <laughs> um, so, Herb? Let me add to this here. Yes. Uh, we cannot ignore, from the standpoint of self-determination, the number of African-American controlled, edited, owned publications. Mm -hmm. Newspapers in particular, magazines and journals. You talk about journals, you talk about Charles Johnson and Opportunity Magazine. Mm -hmm. In 1925, it's going to be his historic moment with Zora at that time and Langston as well. You could talk about the uh, Crisis Magazine, the NAACP's uh, house organ, in which a number of writers found that platform. The Messenger by Chandler Owen. And they feel, uh, I mean, these individuals who were rounding up the more militant radical writers at that time. Um, the Negro World mm -hmm. that came from with uh, Marcus Garvey. And a number of these writers, as they did in the 1960s, there was a kind of a crossover. Mm -hmm. Some of them were writing for what you might call these fugitive journals, these radical rags, mm -hmm. but at the same time were in the mainstream in this opportunity in Crisis Magazine. Mm -hmm. So these were opportunities and platforms to say nothing of the Pittsburgh Courier, the, uh, the Amsterdam News, some of these publications that came at the, at the, 20, at the dawn of the 20th century also provided a platform. So that's an, a part of that mix. You know, David Levering Lewis talks about this and, you yeah. know, when Harlem was when involved. Harlem was involved. Yeah. yeah, I think, and, and, and you've all, you might want to pick up on in terms of the, the kind of trajectory and the influence of these publications in yeah. terms of getting an understand of the political and the cultural balance that was going on at that time. Right, well, the three, the three main journals at the time were, as you, as you mentioned, Opportunity, The Crisis, and The Messenger. Um, what Zora and Langston, Wallace Thurman, um, Bruce Nugent, and um, Aaron Davis, and a few others wanted to do was to create a new magazine, which they called FIRE, which would be, it, the, the goal was to get it banned in Boston, to get it, you know, it was, it was the, the most daring of all these, uh, of all these publications. And it only lasted one issue. Um, but it created a pretty strong impression because it, it opened with Wallace Thurman's tale of a uh, prostitute. Um, Bruce Nugent wrote a very long, what he called novel, um, about a homosexual encounter. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of, yeah, there were a lot of um, illustrations that were very racy. Um, Langston and Zora both contributed quite a bit to the to the magazine, um, and the critics hate the critics hated it. The the more bourgeois critics, for example, the Pittsburgh Courier wanted said that I, I just threw the first issue of Fire into the fire, you know. Um, and du, du, Bois, du Bois really um, tried to steer clear of it as much as he could. Um, so that, there, there was this tension there uh, among all these among all these writers and these different publications, um, but they were very important to them. I mean, uh, Zora published quite a bit in Negro World and in the Pittsburgh Courier, um, and Langston co contributed a great deal to the crisis and to opportunity, um, and uh, but they they weren't these 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 venues were not good for, ex for getting exposed to white readers. For those, for, for getting exposed to white readers, both of these writers had to turn to um, 
publications like the Saturday Evening Post, you know, more more establishment white um, white magazines in which they did publish. Um, Langston published his most important essay in the Nation, for example, uh, which was which is a very establishment, uh, a very cutting edge and establishment journal that that appealed to whites and blacks. So there was there was a a nice um, busting out of the 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 African American uh, journals and and many of these writers were able to get published in the white in the white magazines and then there were the publishing houses themselves and unlike the magazines you didn't have very many black owned presses um, you know for for books uh, so they were so Zorn Langston were published by Lippincott and by Knopf um, who which which were white presses but they had they they were committed to paying special attention to African American writers throughout the Harlem Renaissance and afterwards. And I also I want to be clear that my my trying to set the scene of black and white involvement at this time is one in which I think there's some visions of the Harlem Renaissance as being separate and devoid of any interaction. But we know that folks were coming from uptown to Harlem now in different motivations for that. Right, there's different, yeah. you know, you both have um, written about um, primitivism as a part of modernism, right? Sometimes even when we study the Harlem Renaissance, we do it as separate from modernism, right? Which is, these are the, these are the same movements happening at the yeah. same time, yeah. right? And so I think it's all more complicated than I think mm -hmm. a lot of people feel. But Herb, to your point, I mean, you know, Arturo Schomburg in his famous essay, The Negro Digs Up His Past, Right, talks about right self-reliance, self-liberation, and so again, when we look at publishing arms, right, you see that there's there are a number of things, including the I mean, the first successful collaboration between Zora and and Langston is Fire, right? It's this idea yeah. of, we just gonna burn everything else up, right? We want right. to press the buttons, we want to push society, right? Um, you know, can you all talk about? What is this? What brings these two people together? What is that? This relationship. Well, I think what brings them together is is um, Zora and Langston had shared a vision of African American literature that was very fresh and new and different. Um, though they wrote in quite different styles, they shared this idea that that African American literature could be purely black and separate from all white literature that had come before, that it could be reinvented in a purely African-American idiom. And none of the great writers that came before them had attempted anything quite as radical as this. So they, uh, as you said, they were, they were right at the heart of the modernist period. And the modernist period was one of radical self-reinvention, radical reinvention, right? So that's what they were doing here with Langston was, uh, using the most basic um, vocabulary that anyone on the street could understand. He was, cr he was creating poetry that was very true to, an, to the oral tradition. Uh, and so was Zora. Zora was, was, Zora was basing her uh, stories and her plays on folklore um, and on the oral tradition. So um, they were, you know, uh, Langston, poetically, he took his cues from Carl Sandburg um, and Carl Sandburg was trying to, to make his poetry as simple and direct as possible. He wasn't using the, the modernist technique like William Carlos Williams would cut up his lines in, in, in weird, you know, the line endings would be very, in, in very strange places. And, you know, there'd be these big breaks or um, other modernist poets would, would use a lot of allusions, you know, but, but Langston, like Carl Sandburg, was trying to make things as simple and straightforward as possible. But what his innovation was, where, which Sandburg never went into, was actually taking a blues lyric that he had written and making it a poem and publishing it as a poem, you know, and deriving his, um, his work directly from folk lyric traditions. Um, it was it was very innovative and and very fresh. Um, so I, I what that's that's what brings them together. I think this idea that 
that that they could reinvent African-American literature. And then that leads directly to Mulebone because what better way of commanding the world's attention than to stage a play on Broadway uh, that is purely African-American, purely consists of the folk tradition, has no white influence at all. Uh, that, that's not a musical, it's not a piece of minstrelsy, it's not a it's not a uh, social protest drama. It's this uh, folk comedy, folk-based comedy that they think could advance their cause more than anything. Herb, mm -hmm. for you, what, did, what brings these two people together? <laughs> well, I, I think one of the things about this is that when you talk about Mulebone, you know, in the folkloristic aspects of it, and then you go reflect on the shuffle along going back to the 1920s and where you see the connective tissue there you know mm -hmm. in terms of the entertainment the reflection on the folklore now langston and zora by no means were pioneers on this you had a number going back to the 1880s 1890s with some of the chestnut you know you have to read charles chestnut you get a whole lot of that paul lawrence dunbar you yeah. know, in fact, you know, he, he that was his province, you know, and he was celebrated for that. And many people try to figure out, like, you know, try to understand exactly, you know, what was being said there. In the same way that when Zora comes on with Barra Coon, mm -hmm. and, and that's a challenge right there linguistically. You want to, to read and see how how the uh, language is being, is, is just transmogrified, you do, in a sense, how she has an ear for it, and then have to have the... How do you translate that and put it on the page? That's a very important thing. So that's a continuation from Zora's standpoint in terms of picking up on the folklore from a linguistic standpoint, in terms of the behavior, the interaction, the storytelling, you know, the general feeling, the kind of uh, the, the sharing, you know, of the culture that people had at that time with the dance, the food, right down to the food. Right down to like these images, you talk about the snake and everything. But all these are important elements that you get like Burr Fox and Burr Rabbit, these things that uh, Joel Chandler Harris, you know, put out there for people to pick up and carry right on into the uh, early parts of the 20th century. So the folklore is very important here. So you figure that where would the conflict come in? And they both were very interested in the folklore would there be some difference there in terms of interpretation? Hmm? Right. So, so I wanted to say also, I mean, the love that these two people have for each other, you all, you mention it, you, not, you don't mention it, you wrote a book about it. But there, um, you know, today is Pride Sunday in the United States, and you spoke a bit about who these people were in their personal lives, right? And it kind of, there's a suggestion that something happens in the third party, um, or not in terms of like complicated relationships. Um, but what does it mean that these folks, you know, Zora was famous, you know, she had husbands, she barely wrote about them even in her personal letters. Uh, Langston was famously uh, very, very private about his romantic life. So what, what do we make of, of these two people who love each other desperately and yet, when it comes to this creativity, this creative act, okay, fire, they collaborated, they were fine, but mule bone, this becomes like, this is what separates them. Yeah. Contention. Yeah, it is a bone of contention. That's, that's the name of the short story that the mule bone is, is based on, that Zora wrote. Um, what's, what's happening there, Zora is, Zora and Langston are not physically involved as as romantic lovers in, in a physical sense. Instead, they have a very close emotional relationship. Um, and Langston is very, as you said, very famously private. And, and um, he never, uh, his, his, his physical relationships were, were mostly fleeting and um, he never, he, if, if he felt like he was getting too attached, too close to someone, he would move away. Uh, that's what had happened with him with, and uh, Alan Locke uh, earlier in, in Europe. Um, 
and it also had happened with between him and Count A. Cullen. Um, both of them had these somewhat romantic relationships with, with Langston that he abruptly ended and um, they wouldn't talk to him afterwards. Um, so Zora, um, so, so when Zora and Langston got together to compose Mulebone, they were working with a typist named Louise Thompson who had been married to Wallace Thurman. Um, I was still married to Wallace Thurman, but they were separated. Uh, and she was working on trying to get a divorce. Um, and uh, Langston and the, the three of them just got on like wildfire. They had a great time together. They they stayed up all night. They were, they were laughing and, and typing this play. And and Louise was also typing all of Zora's uh, folk folklore research that she'd been doing in, in Florida. Uh, but Louise was very much in love with Langston. Um, if Langston's mother was urging him to marry her, to marry Louise, and Louise said, said later that if Langston had asked her uh, for her hand, she would have accepted. Um, and Zora picked up on that and um, became a little jealous. She, it wasn't a kind of fury. It wasn't the kind of all-consuming jealousy that, that, that tears your world apart. Um, but that was one reason why things began to go bad. Another reason was that Langston was claiming that he had done a lot more work on the play than he actually had. And he continued to claim that throughout his life. Um, and a third reason was that uh, Charlotte Mason said, stop working on this play and get back to what you're supposed to be doing. Zora, you need to produce this, this uh the, the folklore work that you promised me. And then the fourth reason was after, sh very shortly after that, um, Langston showed the play to a, uh, to a white um, theater director in Pennsylvania um, who did very, you know, kind of small African-American uh, regional theater productions. And, and without consulting Zora, without telling Zora he was doing it, and Zora was horrified because she thought of this as their chance to, to go to put on a show on Broadway. And if a small regional theater did it, it would ruin their chances. And the fact that Langston presented it as, as a play that he had written and, I mean, with Zora, but that he had, you know, wasn't mostly Zora and that he had done this without consulting her um, probably set off a lot of alarm bells in her head. So the combination of all four of those things led to this very acrimonious split. And to this point, I mean, we want to point out that um, while she had been publishing a few short stories, Zora, did, what is she under contract with Charlotte Osgood Mason? So That's she hadn't, right. She hadn't been able to publish what we know her, her most famous works happened afterwards, right? That's right. That's right. Langston had been able to publish his poetry, and then he had written a novel, Not Without Laughter, which Charlotte Mason had bankrolled, and which she had um, played a, a great, she had, she had heavily um, influenced its, uh, and she had basically given him 28 notes of revisions to do, you know. So she was very involved in that. But the contract with Zora that Charlotte Mason had basically said that none of Zora's material was hers, uh, she could not publish it herself. It all belonged to, to Mason, and Mason had uh, had absolute control over it. And it was all folklore gathered material. It wasn't to include any fiction. So Zora stopped writing fiction for a few years and just concentrated on folklore and had no leeway in what she could publish. Thank you. No control. Herb, did you want to say something about yeah. Mealbone? Well, it would be years, it would be many, many years before it finally uh, reached Broadway. That's right. And in 1991, uh, in I think February, winter of 91, I, I saw that one at the Ethel Barrymore Theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ruby D and Ossie Davis's son, Guy Davis, you know, he was an understudy for four of the parts. Can you imagine <laughs> that? 
Wow. <laughs> Four parts, including Jim, you know, and uh, and the other Dave. main character there, because Dave, Dave yeah. and Jim, you know, he had to understudy both those. And I can't remember whether he did Jim or David in the, in, uh, the version that I saw, but he mm -hmm. had to perform. He was a very fine guitarist. And mm -hmm. the whole contention there, the whole music, the liveliness, you know, of that particular uh, part of Eatonville, all of that came alive on the stage. So that was, I mean, all these many years before it really reached the stage, although they had some, I guess, you know, caramel, caramel theater, you know, in terms of uh, doing some smaller productions of that at some point. Of course, uh, I think uh, what happens with uh, Louise Patterson or Louise uh, Thompson, she became Patterson later on because she married William Patterson, mm -hmm. the guy, the great communist who, who wrote the book, uh, We Charge Genocide. And of course now her daughter has come along with the book, begin to give us some uh, another perspective. So from one generation to another, trying to understand exactly the conflict, the turmoil, you know, mm -hmm. between Zora and possibly Louise, you know, what's going on with that? Because her suspicion is that, you know, hey, you don't take the money and, and give it to Louise, you know, be, and it's never really clear about that relationship. Although you have a feeling that there was this year, like, you know, a little animosity there that she mm -hmm. had with Louise, who was no more than a functionary for, for the godmother. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So how did they end up? What happened? What's, I, I think you, you, you have it, you have your, your last chapter you wrote in the book is about the aftermath. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the remaining decade. <laughs> okay. I mean, what happened in the end was in, it, in Langston was in Cleveland and, um, and he was very good friends with um, some theater producers there named the Jellies. Uh, they received a manuscript of Mulebone, which had only Zora's name on it. Um, and Zora never wanted that manuscript to ever go to Cleveland, but um, it was sent there by the Samuel French agency who had gotten it from Carl Van Vechten. Uh, it was a long, complicated story, but um, Langston was horrified to see that the, the play that he'd worked on only had Zora's name on it. So he kind of mixed the two versions that he had, the one that he had and the one that Zora had sent and copyrighted it under both of their names is Mulebone, not knowing that Zora had already copyrighted a version that she had written under her own name alone, um, under the title De Turkey and the Law. Um, so you've got this incredibly complicated um, thing. They start phoning each other, writing each other letters um, for a period of three or four weeks. Zora finally comes out to Cleveland She's about to tell the Jellies that, okay, you can put on this play. And then she finds out that Louise Thompson had preceded her and visited Cleveland a few days earlier. And she blows up and she, uh, she tells them all to go to hell. And she causes this huge scene. Everyone's furious, everyone's shouting and she leaves and that's the end of it. So after that, you have this aftermath where um, they can't avoid each other completely. You know, they're, they're two of the more prominent African-American writers. Um, and they, they have very mixed, you know, Zora seems to have very mixed feelings about, about Langston. Um, on the one hand, she tells Arna Bontemps that the cross of her life is the breakup with Langston. And um, and he, it's, it's kind of clear that she, she really misses the friendship. Um, but Langston acts very cold and doesn't respond. Then Langston pens his autobiography, The Big C, and treats um, Zora with a great deal of condescension um, and falsifies what happened with Mulebone in the book. So Zora is inspired to write her own autobiography um, after reading The Big C and leaves Langston out of it altogether. And she writes a whole chapter on friendship and names all of her friends, all the people that I've mentioned, and leaves Langston out completely. And then 
Uh, she attacks Langston for being a communist in the pages of, I think, the American Mercury, Saturday Evening Post. You know, she goes on the war path against Langston for, for being a communist. Um, Langston uh, basically tries to have nothing to do with Zora. And it's, it's a very sad ending to this, uh, to this great friendship that they had. Yeah, um, I wanted to turn now for questions. We had a couple of questions. One, the first was, what was Elaine Locke's relationship with Zora Neale Hurston? Well, Elaine Locke was uh, her professor at Howard, um, encouraged her writing, uh, published her very first short story. Um, he uh, was, he remained good friends with her, um, for many, many years. Um, they had a dust up. Um, he wrote a very negative review of Their Eyes Were Watching God. Um, and she attacked him. You know, the, the essay that she wrote about him is one of the most cutting pieces of, of writing I've ever read. But it was never published, so it just exists in manuscript form and then was later published much, much later. Uh, and she made up with him. Now, his relationship with Langston Hughes was quite different. He fell in love with Langston Hughes, um, tried to seduce him, gave him an ultimatum. Uh, Langston turned him down and he never forgave Langston. And in the mule bone controversy, he savagely attacked Langston um, and uh, told Charlotte Mason all sorts of horrible things about him. Um, later on, um, they happened to be on a boat together um, to Europe, and um, and uh, and they refused to shake hands. You know, <laughs> it's just that th this kind of really uh, unpleasant, uh, unpleasant relationship. Yeah, I, I had read in your book you talked about um, Bruce Nugent. Um, saying that it was kind of like a divorce, right? Like he he flee he goes to Zora's side, right? And it was like mm -hmm. you almost get the sense that artists were choosing sides or had to yes. choose sides between. Yeah. Um, there's another question about what's the role of the what was the role of the church during this time of the Black Church? Did it have any impact on the Harlem Renaissance? It certainly did. I mean the. Zora, Zora was very, very interested in the black church and she introduced Carl Van Vechten to it. She took him to uh, kind of underground prayer meetings, you know, the, where, where he could be exposed to the kind of church music that, that he'd only been exposed to the spiritual sung by the Tuskegee Institute singers, you know, uh, he hadn't really heard the real thing. Um, and she did a lot of work on, on, um, on folklore that, that, that had to do with, with the black church. But then uh, in terms of religion, she was very interested in voodoo and underwent this harrowing initiation into voodoo in New Orleans. And she also investigated hoodoo practices in the Caribbean. So um, she was very interested in black spirituality in general, um, but not in the kind of more conventional um, uh, the, the kind of churches that say um, W.B. Du Bois or Jesse Fawcett went to, you know, she was much more interested in the, in the folklore, uh, the folkloric religious traditions. Uh, Langston, on the other hand, really didn't, um, he really didn't have much to do with, with the church at all. Um, his, he was much more interested in, in other forms of African-American folklore. One of the things you all that you have with uh, with uh, Zora's take on the uh, the black church, is that this scene, the trial scene in Mulebone, mm -hmm. you know, there's this contention in that community between the Methodists and the Baptists. Mm -hmm. However, right. the trial is conducted in the Baptist church, right? Right, <laughs> right. It's just sort of the preference, you know, given to that. And I think the voodoo stuff is absolutely on point because mm -hmm. uh, she had this concern about the various ritual, the ritualistic aspects of all of these things. And, uh, and she found ways to integrate that in a number of her short stories, you know. That's so, right. so I think 
I think one of the things about Langston, you have to understand that, uh, you know, he's a person who was a fellow traveler, you might say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was hooked up with the militant radicals, the, le the legal struggle for Negro rights. I mean, he was the president of that. So he was affiliated with a number of activist bodies. And I think one of the things, I don't know if you touch on this uh, in, in the book in terms of him as a translator, mm -hmm. because, you know, he's quite proficient in both Portuguese, Spanish, and French. So right. the whole, and the negritude thing has to be brought into focus too, because mm -hmm. Langston was kind of the, the connective tissue there. He was the, along with Claude McKay. They mm -hmm. facilitated that connection between Aimé Césaire and Leopold Senghor. These negritude writers who later on would pick up some of the energy that flowed from out of out of the uh, Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. well, and also, I mean, both of them, both of them had those relationships. Certainly, you know, again, I don't know that people really know this or acknowledge this, but their eyes were watching God was written while Zora was in Haiti for seven mm -hmm. weeks, right? So she was doing like, of course, she did her folkloric work both in Jamaica and in Haiti, but then went back to write that novel and then you know, uh, Hughes's relationship is not only with Negative Dudes and, and those authors, Jacques Clement and, and IT again, but also with Cuba and Nicolas Guillén and his father okay. having lived in Mexico and him having lived in Mexico. There's a chunk of time for like a year and change that he was in Mexico, right? So right. we're talking about folks who were, you know, if not, I mean, Hughes, we're probably talking fluency in, in yeah. Spanish, Portuguese and French. Um, and then Zora, of course, also has, you know, she has a different relationship, but she's in an environment where Creole, of course, is happening, is being talked all the time, and so, and her participation in these rituals. So, you know, these, these are very multi-dimensional, rich, exactly. like, intellectuals, knowledge producers, creators, right. right, that we're talking about. Um, two more questions. One was about... Well, several more questions. Thank you all for coming in with questions now. How significant were the sample stories to Langston Hughes's canon? And how might Jesse B. Semple align with Zora Neale Hurston's folkloric writing? I think Herb should answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things, I think I kind of halfway uh, broached that earlier in terms of looking at like what she did with Vera Coon, mm -hmm. which is really a story, this is a very interesting story I'm halfway through it now, and it, it's a slow, you have to take your time with it because of the, the language differences there. But we talk about the translation and hearing and c copying. She had a great ear, it's an amazing ear. This is Kujo, Kujo Lewis was like the last survivor, you know, in terms of the Atlantic slave trade. And she hooked up with him and got him to somewhat reluctantly to tell his story. And that's what she transcribed. She's putting it all down. Langston had a, another kind of ear when he came to Harlem. And he used Jesse B. Semple as a kind of an alter ego or, you know, a doppelganger who could pick up on some of the language and style and rhythm signifying whatever, you know, was going down linguistically in Harlem at that time. So you do have a kind of a comparison there in terms of their understanding in different contexts, in terms of how the language is evolving and where do we find the trajectory of these things. To some extent, it arrived in Mule Bone. And I thought Michael Schultz, who directed that uh, the version in 1991, he did a good job of working right back and forth between the linguistic stuff because if you keep it straight as it was, a lot of the audience didn't know what the hell was going on. You know, you had to break it down, slow it down, and almost like going to an opera. Can you have the subscripts running up on the screen so we understand exactly what these people are saying and doing? So he had to eliminate a lot of what you might call the as uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar was doing with you know this here dialect thing had to be kind of modified a bit so the information could be transferred in terms of the whole life and energy of those people in Edenville. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, one question, Zora Neale Hurston, it's, Zora Neale Hurston died impoverished and in obscurity. How big a factor did her gender play? Huge, huge, mm -hmm. um, very, very big, because uh, she was 
roundly attacked by all of the African-American male writers, um, just about everyone. It's not just Langston Hughes. Richard Wright attacked her work. Um, Sterling, um, uh, um, sorry, Ralph Ellison attacked her work. Um, there, there were just uh, all, the, all these different African-American writers, uh, male writers, um, put her down and basically said, called her a darkie or said that she was pandering to white audiences. Um, and um, she had very, so she had very little, little she, had, she had basically no support in the African-American community and, and uh, at, for her work uh, at that point. And, and or, or, you know, for, from earlier in, in in the 1940s, she was accused of child molestation. Um, and again, that was a gen probably a gender-based um, accusation. It, there was absolutely no truth in it, but it, it, it really um, soured her on, on African-American, on, on, I don't know, on, on kind of the, the, the African-American scene that she had been in. Um, she became increasingly conservative and basically stopped writing about African-Americans. Um, her last few works, many of which are lost, are, are all about white people or about um, biblical figures. Um, so that I think gender had a big, had a, had a big role to play. I think that the, 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 her, her male critics did not understand where she was coming from um, and treated her very condescendingly. The condescension in, in Wallace Thurman's writing about her is just, it's horrifying. And, and, and when you read The Big C, you see it too. It's, it's a very, very paternalistic um, way of treating her. So I think, I think it's a major factor. I would like to say also, I mean, just the, what we see in terms of like the recuperation of her by black women, right? Beginning exactly. with yeah. Alice Walker in 1973, I think, or in the early 70s. And then, I mean, to this day, I mean, if we compare their, their output, but also what happened after their deaths, right? Langston Hughes continues to be known as the, you know, the poet laureate of Harlem, but not so many people really read his stuff beyond the weary blues. Like there's a comfort level to that, that young, handsome, you know, jazz inflected, blues inflected poet. They don't really talk about him going off to the Spanish Civil War or reporting as a journalist or the simple stories or being in the Chicago Defender or anything post that young man versus Zora Neale Hurston continues. I mean, Barracoon just came out, right? Like we're yeah. seeing elections are like being reissued. Like now it's almost like an annual basis like for the last several years. So I think right. it's a really interesting turn of events for both of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what happened really, Robert Hemingway was was a scholar, a white, a white male scholar who decided to do a biography of Zora Neale Hurston and did this amazing amount of research and then Alice Walker came in, came along, and um, and she uh, and and his his work, you know, his work is is great, but it didn't have it didn't command much attention at the time when it came out. It took Alice Walker and Ms. Magazine to really get Zora Neale Hurston's reputation back to where it is now. Um, and and you're right, a number of other African American women writers um, have pushed Zora Neale Hurston so that now um, Their Eyes Were Watching God is the most widely read work by an African-American. You know, if you look at the actual, I looked at the actual sales figures, uh, it outsells the autobiography of Malcolm X. It outsells Invisible Man. It, it outsells everything else. Um, so it, I think it's, I think it's, it, it, it wouldn't have been that way without African-American women leading the way. Um, so we have two more questions. One is, can you tell us about, about Zora Hurston and her role in the strange murder case of Ruby McCollum in Florida? So this is much later, right? Much later. Um, and, then, I, and then last question is, what at the end of the day was both artists' wishes and visions for Black Americans? 
Okay. Well, uh, I don't really know that much about the Ruby McCollum. Uh, I, I, I don't really feel qualified to talk about it because it wasn't a focus of my research and it, it happened so much later than the than what was uh, what, what I really wrote about. But to address the other question, at the end of the day, um, what were their visions? Um, the Zora, Zora turned increasingly conservative. Um, she always had a a bit of a segregationist point of view. Um, for her, uh, African Americans, um, their culture, their essence flourished best in isolation um, at, without contact with whites. And she took that to an extreme until by the 1960s, she was writing anti-integration anti editorials. Um, Langston, on the other hand, uh, right after the right after the breakup with Charlotte Mason and Zora Neale Hurston, turned to communism, and became uh, very much allied with the Soviet Union's um, and the Communist Party's efforts to, uh, you know, defend the Scottsboro Boys, for example, um, to draw the world's attention to black oppression in the United States. Um, and he really towed the Communist Party line for a few years before he found a new voice and a new independence um, and became, I think that in his mind, he thought of himself as the spokesman, as, as kind of a spokesman for black America. And it, certainly in, in his anthology works, he, he did anthologies of American of, of African American humor, of African American folklore. Um, he, uh, he, he worked, as, as, as Herb pointed out, um, he worked with negritude authors from all over the world. He, he, had, he, he became, in a way, like this, uh, this ur African American literature. Um, and, it, and it's, it's, it's interesting in, in that Frederick Douglass also, near the end of his life, also envisioned himself that way, that he, was, that, that he also was trying to stand in for, for African-Americans as a whole um, and, and trying to take on the whole, the, the mantle of, of, the, of African-American oppression and African-American freedom and, and heroism. Um, so, Langston assumes this important important place in in, in African American literature, um, while Zora gets completely pushed to the margins. Herb, what do you think their visions were? I think one of the things, though, of Vanessa that pushed her to the margin was her position on. I mean, 1954, we had this major civil rights decision. Yeah. How could you absolutely, she'd be tone deaf, you know, to be in opposition to that. Right. You know, Brown versus the Board of Education, you're going to have some, some, some differences with that. But then you, you get to some of the other issues in there. And, and Yuval is absolutely right. You know, that conservative swing for the publications, the letters, I was checking out uh, what Carla Kaplan did with old letters yeah. from her letters in there. William Bradford Huey, William Bradford Huey is this a writer who did this stuff, you know, on the uh, two men who killed Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. he, he got a large sum of money to write for Life magazine. These, these guys confessed to the killing. The actual lynching of Emmett Till confessed to that. Of course, a whole double indemnity. I mean, they couldn't be tried because that's over and done with. She communicated with him, congratulated him back and forth. They went, the whole Ruby McCallum thing came up in these letters, you know, with William Bradford Huey. And of course, he was just, an, at that time, a very opportunistic writer. And she was seeing, using him as a platform, a conduit, in terms of appealing to certain audiences out there, congratulating him. And that's where the last thing she had to say about Langston Hughes 
was her in her letters to William Bradford Huey, kind of a stinging indictment. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, thank you both. Um, this, this Sunday afternoon, I want to make mention of a couple of things. This recording is going to be available on the Harlem One Stop YouTube and Facebook page. For those who've missed it, it will also be available on the Black, Black Studies program uh, Facebook page and the Langston Hughes Festival Facebook page. Um, the Black Studies program every year for the last 42 years has put on an annual celebration in honor of Langston Hughes where we celebrate um, African diasporic writers um, throughout, throughout the, the, there we are, um, in the United States. And so November 12th, we always have something two weeks before Thanksgiving. So that is two Thursdays before Thanksgiving. And so please look out for more information about that. I want to thank Yuval Taylor, her boy, Lana Turner, UN Chen, Harlem One Stop, um, Nadal, um, our tech person, thank you all for coming and joining us in this literary salon this Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Got your BV. Good one. <laughs>